Welcome to the Pearson Center webinar on recovering tourism. Out today, as the height of the tourist season is in kickoff mode here in the year 2022, the year that Canadians get back to one of their favorite passions, being tourists. My name is Andrew Cardozo, and I'm president of the Pearson Center. I want to start by recognizing that the Pearson Center is headquartered on the traditional lands of the Algonquin and Anishinaabe peoples, and we welcome our speakers and audience who are joining us from across Turtle Island. As you may know, the Pearson Center is a, is a leading progressive think tank that addresses the leading economic and social issues of the day. We are one of the few think, think tanks which regularly invites representatives from all five political parties, along with business, labor, and civil society leaders, and many other experts. As we like to say, we bring people and ideas together. A special thank you to you, the donors and sponsors, especially the sustaining sponsors, who are Canada's Building Trades Unions, the International Association of Firefighters, and Amapsio Ontario's professional employees. Just briefly on the format, we have an hour-long session. We're following a moderated discussion for about 40 minutes. We will take questions from you, the audience. So please use the question box on your screen, and we will get to as many questions as we can. We will end the session promptly at 5 p.m. Eastern time. Our webinar today is called Recovering Tourism. Over the last two years and a bit, the, touris the tourism industry has been one of the hardest hit. So today, we are going to talk about how we recover this sector. We have a stellar panel today. I am pleased to tell you that we are joined by Beth Potter, President and CEO of the Tourism Industry Association of Canada, commonly known as TIAC, a position she began last year. She's also been President and CEO of the Tourism Industry Association of Ontario and Executive Director of Camping in Ontario. At the international level, Beth is an active member of the World Travel and Tourism Council, notably their COVID-19 task force. Philip Mondor is president and CEO of Tourism HR Canada, the leading organization that prepares the human resource needs, or that, that addresses the human resource needs of the sector. He's a seasoned labor market specialist who is widely consulted by labor market stakeholders across Canada and abroad, including businesses, education, and training bodies. Michael Weiler is, is co-chair of the Parliamentary Tourism Caucus. He's a member of Parliament for the riding with the most tourism-friendly name, West Vancouver Sunshine Coast Sea to Sky Highway. An absolutely beautiful riding if you haven't been there. Time to do it this summer, maybe. Before being elected in 2019, he was an environmental and natural resource management lawyer and worked in the international development field. I'm delighted to tell you that our moderator today is Eleanor McMahon. She's president and CEO of Trans Canada Trail, the longest trail in the world, and has just developed with the government the world's first national trails strategy. She is founder of the Share the Share the Road Cycling Coalition and has been an MPP in Ontario and notably for today's discussion, Minister of Tourism, Culture and Sport in Ontario. With that, over to you, Eleanor McMahon. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Andrew. And I want to, on behalf of everyone listening in and our fellow panelists today, thank the, uh, the Pearson Center for uh, mobilizing this fascinating and very timely conversation and for asking me to be here a moderator, this is an august audience of really fabulous and very uh, smart people. So I'm going to do my best to uh, keep up and to keep the conversation rolling. And I know you're going to come back to us at the end, Andrew, with some questions from our audience to really, uh, you know, uh, really get the sense and the analysis of what's going on and what we can do collectively to help those of us who are in the tourism sector, notably today's panelists. So I want to begin by asking uh, two of our experts who are here today, uh, both Beth and uh, Philip, to really, and I, maybe I'll start with you, Beth, to paint a picture of the last two years uh, till say last winter. Uh, where do things stand today? What are the main challenges as Canadians return to international travel? Hopefully they're traveling more in this country as well. Uh, are Canadians ready to travel? 
Thanks, Eleanor. And maybe what I'll do is I'll just start with where we were two years ago. Um, you know, the tourism industry in Canada in 2019 um, had been growing significantly for a number of years. And in fact, our growth was outpacing uh, all other economic sectors when, it, it, you know, when you look at its contribution to GDP. We were $105 billion a year industry. We employed one in 10 Canadians and we contributed 2% of GDP. Fast forward through the pandemic and we were 50% of what we were prior to the pandemic uh, for the last two years. We, you know, thank goodness for domestic travel because that helped to keep some of the lights on, but international travel for 2020 and 2021 was down to 83%. It was down 83% in total. So we've got uh, a lot of rebuilding to do and we need to re-engage uh, the world in choosing Canada as a nation. And we, I will say that we also, and, and Phil will speak to this more robustly, but we lost a huge amount of our workforce. And so we are challenged on many fronts right now to really reimagine uh, the tourism industry and bring it back to uh, it, what it was just two and a bit short years ago. Wow. Can, can I just uh, perhaps get you to expand a little bit, Beth, on do you have a, a sense of when you when you see the return to health? Is there a maybe there isn't, but is there a timeline where you say in three years from now or five years from now, we think that the return to health is forecast or maybe that's just impossible to do, given the changing nature? Oh, I think we've lost Beth a bit. Well, you know, um, a couple of months ago, we were looking at. Sorry, my hello. You're back. So um, uh, earlier in the year. OK, great. Earlier in the year, we were looking at the forecast and, um, it, you know, in conjunction with our partners at Destination Canada. And we were really looking at, you know, a full return of the domestic market by the end of 2023, um, but we would not get back to a full return of the international market until the end of 2025. Now that I will say was really, you know, just as the uh, situation between Russia and Ukraine was starting, uh, the impact of inflation uh, wasn't really known at that point in time, um, and certainly the rising costs and interruption of, of supplies and the interruption of our supply chain at that point weren't factors. And so we're just in the process right now of re-looking at what those forecasted dates look like. But as you can expect, we're pushing them out. Uh, Philip, uh, perhaps your take then on the last two years in conjunction with Beth's overview. And uh, thank you, Eleanor. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you. I'm, of course, I'm speaking specifically to the labor point and picking up on one item that Beth just talked about, but we lost nearly a million workers at the onset of the pandemic, and today we remain about 25% down on where we would normally track. And of those people working with us today, they're only getting about 60% of the hours they would have had pre-pandemic. So we were at just over 2.1 million workers. That was the largest number we were tracking. We were seeing growth trajectories for the summer at record numbers that would have reached about 2.5 million and then the bottom fell out. These impacts affected all regions of Canada in most of our occupations in all five industries that make up the sector. That includes the food and beverage industry, the accommodation, travel services, transportation, outdoor recreation. You know, an example of these shortages that I know everyone is well aware of are those that you heard about at Pearson Airport, but that's just one little drop in that bucket. You're asking Beth about recovery timeline. We just got new data in collaboration with Conference Board, and we don't see numbers, uh, pre-pandemic numbers, till late 2025 uh, for a good portion of the occupations that impact the sector, but some don't uh, recover until 2028. So that gives you an idea of the protracted nature of this and the challenge ahead of us. Well, that sounds, Philip, as so it's an all hands on deck sort of endeavor and, uh, you know, um, getting getting the sector back to full employment and given the confluence of some events that are monumental and cyclical in nature, the economy, as Beth mentioned, you know, the um, 
the rising cost of living and the impact on Canadians' travel choices. Um, given that you're looking at 2025, maybe could you touch on some of the things that you'd like to see? And I'm going to talk, talk, turn to Patrick for a moment to talk about the caucus and how you're working proactively with uh, the industry leaders, such as the two we have today, to address them. You know, this is a very complex program, uh, problem that we're facing, and it, and it goes beyond just the shortages that we tend to characterize as the issue. There are structural and systemic workforce issues. Some of these we were, um, you know, facing pre-pandemic, as it were, but they were certainly heightened by the pandemic. So, you know, if I just want to break that down a little bit, and then I can answer your question better, but... You know, these, uh, the short supply of workers is one area we have a problem. As I say, we're about 250,000 job vacancies today across all of the five industries. Many, by the way, are in the management-related occupations or in senior roles. And that attributes to about 25% of all job vacancies in Canada as we speak across the economy. Um, there, and there's an ever-growing competition for workers moving forward. It's not going to get better. It's going to get more challenging. But it's also about the growing skills mismatch. Currently in our workforce, 25 to 40% of our workers do not have the skills to manage what's required of them or to cope with demands. So that means there's burnout, there's turnover, there's lack of productivity. And again, this is in fact impacting a lot of the management people. And finally, another factor concerns mobility and employment barriers for both job seekers or workers and students. There are a lot of factors here, housing, transportation, incentives and supports for relocation. You know, that's your classic challenge of people without jobs, jobs without people scenario. And finally, there's consequences of these issues um, and additional factors attributing specifically to COVID, where basically the industry is facing its greatest challenge ever in terms of image liability or reputational damage, where jobs have been further devalued and there's increasing damage to public sentiment of the sector. So it's a challenge for sure ahead of us. Um, so working with governments has been very important. Did you want me to elaborate on where we're doing that at the moment or? That'd be lovely. And I'm gonna get Patrick to maybe amplify some of your points. Look, the government of Canada has really stepped up in, in this challenge uh, in the last two years. And, and there's a lot at play right now. I'll just use a few examples without using all the time here. You know, recently we heard uh, about temporary foreign worker program, for example, where uh, the quota for the number of workers uh, that could be employed in our sector went up sizably. So that's an example of a short term measure that we hope industry will benefit more from. It's not without its challenges, but it's certainly a strong indicator of a move in the right direction. There's also been a lot of measures, uh, both federally and provincially, around immigration uh, streams, particularly around provincial nominee programs. And in recent weeks, a lot of discussions around linking to Ukrainian citizens and Afghan refugees. So these are examples of how government has really paired up with the industry to try and respond in the short term. It's not without its challenges. You know, capacity is a challenge. I mean, the worker shortages we talk about in our industry are fact, some of the challenges government have with their own workers. Um, there are other measures, of course. There's work being done with employers. There's work being done with education community. The long term is really where the lens has to be on this, though. And I'll just say a few more words before you pass the baton on. But, you know, our analysis of this is that we need to focus in the longer term, particularly around policy changes. And in that front, we've been working a lot with the national associations, TIAC being a good example and a key lead, where we need to see some massive changes in immigration, in the, in the education systems particularly. And finally, one other thing that government we are anticipating will step up and, um, and it's looking very positive is around more effort on career and job promotion for this sector with consorted tools to help with both um, employers and what we call intermediaries like the education system, career development practitioners, serving agencies and others. So there's, there's a quite a robust strategy we've employed through a task force and of course in collaboration with other efforts. So I, I can say a whole lot more there, Eleanor, but so I don't take up all the time. I just thought I would uh, prime it a bit. Thank you, uh, Philip. That, that really sets the table for Patrick to talk about, I think, the caucus now, having had our industry leaders uh, give you uh, sort of a brief overview on some of the challenges. And of course, your 
well aware of them as a member of parliament that's the co-chair of the caucus so maybe you could tell our listeners uh, about the caucus it's unique sort of non-partisan format which is terrific and who's in it and and uh, what are the main challenges you see what lies ahead yeah, gladly, and, and thanks, Eleanor. I just want to first begin by acknowledging that I'm streaming from the traditional unceded territory of the Squamish and Lilwat people uh, in Whistler right now. And, uh, and of course, Whistler is a huge tourism destination um, in the country. It actually generates 25% of the tourism export revenue for BC um, alone. And, uh, and so this, you know, tourism is a huge sector in my riding. And, uh, and you know, I've been the co-chair of the all-party par all parliamentary tourism caucus uh, since the last election. And what, what this caucus is, it's a grouping of uh, members of parliament of all parties and, and senators. And the idea behind it is we wanted to create a forum to be able to understand and deal with the biggest issues that we're facing um, as a country right now in tourism. And the idea is by having all parties together, uh, we can agree on things in a more nonpartisan way and I think tourism really provides a unique example of this um, because unlike other sectors, tourism is part of the economy in every region of the country. It actually provides more jobs in rural areas than in, in urban areas. It employed uh, over 2 million people pre-pandemic. And so it's really important that we get this right. Um, and that's why we have this caucus so that we can agree on what needs to be done and so we can speak with a common voice to be able to do that. And uh, you know, we, we've had a number of meetings so far. We've, we've been able to, uh, to connect with a lot of the, the national organizations like, like Tourism HR and, and ITAC and others. And, uh, and one of the other big things that, that we're working on right now is having a collective submission that will be as part of the, the federal tourism growth strategy, which we launched consultations on last month and uh, what we're hoping to update for, for this fall as well. And so, uh, so we have uh, two co-chairs, myself and Senator Karen Sorensen, as well as we have vice chairs from each of the uh, each of the recognized parties in in the house. And uh, and so it's been a it's been a good forum so far, and we're looking to be able to provide some some very meaningful input for for our ministers, and uh, and as well for, for this tourism growth strategy we're working on right now. You know, and which is a fabulous overview, Patrick. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to put you in the hot seat, but I sort of am. Just maybe you could touch on the one challenge that for you keeps coming back time and time again as Canadians get ready to travel this season. Certainly as an MP, you're hearing things from your constituents as well. But it, it, there may, may be one or two things that you think these are the things that we need to address as a, address as a priority, particularly given the overview that Beth and Philip have uh, presented. Yeah, well, I, I think the, the the biggest thing for the for the sector is is really the labor shortages that we have right now. And and Philip talked a little bit about that, how there's a quarter million unfilled jobs right now. Um, there were issues with the labor shortages pre-pandemic as well, um, but it's very much was exacerbated once uh, once we shut down in in 2020 in, in March. And I remember because I was actually here in Whistler once Vail made the decision to shut down the mountain. And there was a huge outflow of a lot of uh, international workers that were here, and they, they, many of them have not come back. And uh, and you know a lot of backlogs built up at immigration um, with the temporary foreign workers program and others. And over the course of the pandemic, we didn't have people that were coming here on holiday working visas, so that that caused a problem as well. And and with increases in housing costs and um, you know lack of available affordable childcare it really had a, a pretty devastating impact on the labor market. And so this is something that is going to require, yes, making some changes to our immigration system. And, and Phil uh, mentioned some of the big programs that we're working on to do just that. Um, it also means making sure that we're having the right training, people coming out of universities to do that, uh, making sure that we're promoting the sector as, as a really uh, attractive career going forward for a lot of people. Um, so that we're able to, to to make sure that we're able to tackle that. And to give you an example, uh, you know, I know some businesses in my riding that would have a record day for revenue one day, and they would have to shut down the next day because they didn't have enough staff to operate it. And so I think that it really goes to show that, you know, A, we do have a huge demand for people to travel and to visit places, but if we don't have adequate staffing there, uh, we're not going to be able to take advantage of that. And it's going to also hurt the long time the long-term brand for destinations from across the country. So um, I'd say that's that's probably the, the biggest issue that we we have to tackle right now. 
Um, I think some of the other areas is just, just the pressure that we've seen with, with some of our infrastructure. And, and most notably, it's, it's been a challenge with, with airports, or maybe rather at this point, just, just one airport. Um, and, and that's, of course, the Pearson Airport in Toronto. Uh, I'm just making sure that we're able to um, facilitate people coming to Canada, uh, whether that's by making sure that we have um, you know, ad adequate staff to be able to handle the amount of demand and, and uh, flights that we now have coming back, uh, as well as just facilitating the process for people to go through immigration or um, customs rather once they arrive here. And so we've, done a, we've hired a tremendous amount of, of folks to be able to speed that up. There's been about 850 people that have been hired at, at CATSA to do that. And, and we're also providing about an additional 330 million so that we're able to get back to 2019 levels of service and reduce some of the pressure that we have on the system. So, you know, those are probably the, the, the two biggest ones that, that I mentioned right now. Um, but I can say on both fronts, there's lots of work that's being done at the federal government level to use that pressure. Uh, that's great. I'm, I am going to come back to you and to all of you actually with a question about, you know, what can we do as tourists and uh, what can you do as government? Uh, what can industry do? How is this collaborative approach? How is it going to be meaningful and successful? And as a tourist myself or someone who hopes to be more of a tourist this summer, I am doing some staycations here, growing the local economy. But uh, your advice, also I'll come back to each one of you on that and, and Beth. I wondered if I could, given your mention earlier of your international role, and Andrew mentioned it, I know that you're someone who thinks globally, and because the sector is global, I wondered if there's anything that you're hearing amongst your your colleagues around the world that that could be helpful to us here in Canada, um, given that some of the challenges are probably occurring in other places as well, labor shortages, uh, wait times, and so on. Have you had colleagues, uh, sorry, conversations with your colleagues? And is there anything emerging that might be helpful for us to be thinking about? Absolutely. So, um, what I will what I will say is that the challenges that we are facing here in Canada are we're not alone. Um, we are in very good company when we look at many other countries around the globe. Um, so. Um, we're learning from each other. We're, you know, the the idea of being at the global table is so that we can share best practices um, and, and really start to understand, you know, and, and maybe even see, you know, trends that are starting to emerge in other parts of the world um, ahead of, of here in Canada. Um, but I, I will say that, you know, Patrick mentioned, um, and, and, and you mentioned the, you know, the situation with, with air travel right now. And it is, it's not just air travel. Um, we've got a, a challenge at pretty much every um, method of travel uh, as it, they come into the country. Um, you know, things are not running very smoothly right now, um, you know, for cruising. Um, and so when cruise passengers go to get off the boat, they're actually having to go through a different set of procedures than, you know, an air passenger is having to go through. And, you know, you know, the, the, the challenges for uh, passengers arriving by land um, are also um, slightly different. And so we are, we're really working in a bit of a cyclone. <laughs> um, and we're trying to uh, bring all of um, the different authorities together, so whether it's NAV Canada, um, you know, CATSA, CBSA, the airlines, the airports, um, you know, the labor unions that that uh, supply the the labor for the for the different um, services. You know, we're trying to bring everybody together and really look at all of the um, challenges because, and we're not alone. So if a flight is canceled or delayed in a destination in the US that's coming into Canada, you know, it, there's a knock-on effect or a domino effect. And so we are also working with our international partners at IATA and, and, um, and other uh, global organizations to try and address the ongoing, um, uh, you know, chaos really that, that is, you know, the business of border management and moving people back and forth across the border. But I guess what I will say to everyone, um, and especially to tourists, and that is pack your patience. You know, 
it, you know, educate yourself as much as you can before you leave the house. Um, do it when you're planning your vacation. Understand what's going to be expected of you, what's going to be required, what the situation might look like when you get there, and and be informed. Um, when you get to an airport, when you get to the to the land border crossing, uh, when you wherever you're going, remember we are all in a staff shortage situation. So the people that showed up, and we've all seen the signs in restaurants and retail. You know, the people that showed up today are the ones that showed up to be nice to them. It's the same across all methods of transportation and all those interactions that you have, whether it's with security, whether it's with border agents, whether it's with airline staff, whether it's with the, the duty-free shop owners at the, at the border, whoever, they're the ones that are there. So like, let's everybody just like take a deep breath and, and, and be kind to each other because that's the only way we're all gonna get through it with any kind of um, love and still, and still enjoy the fact that we're traveling again. It's interesting, Beth. I, I was I read in it almost an advice column from a, a flight attendant, an anonymous flight attendant. It was, and that was really her lead: be kind, to everyone, and buckle up because this is not your standard travel season. And she was actually highlighting how labor shortages. She did talk uh, extensively about that and the burnout and how exhausted current staff are. And she also talked about something that I found quite compelling, but very logical, which is because of labor shortages, flight attendants and pilots can only work so many hours a day by law. And so if they get to a destination and they've been delayed, all of a sudden they can't work anymore. And if there's no one to take their place, then the flight gets canceled and then we're in another conundrum and then moving flights around the country. So that's only air travel, but nonetheless, I thought it was a really illustrative point of the, the knockoff effect of one very small part of the sector. I know labor shortages is no small thing, of course, Philip, it isn't, but it does have an, a, a ripple effect on our travel plans and Canadians having that understanding and packing your patients and be kind. Well, I, mean, I think, I mean, to, to your point, Eleanor, there are so many moving parts in this situation. You know, nobody really knows um as a traveler like why they're not moving faster through a line or why they're sitting on a plane on a tarmac so you know let's not be negative about it let's not publicly moan and complain let's make sure that we understand that we're all coming back from something you know it's easy to turn off our travel systems it's a lot harder to turn it back on and we just we need some time and we need some people and we need time to train those people and so in the meantime if we could just all you know be kind about um our interactions and, and what we say publicly that will go a long way yeah well very well said uh, philip uh, just to you now to really talk a little bit more or to share more perhaps you your very comprehensive um, earlier response talked about career and job promotion and things like immigration and labor. Given that um, one of the takeaways I had from your earlier comments is that some of these problems actually uh, were with us prior to the pandemic. And I wonder, does this a perfect storm that we're seeing now give us the opportunity to sort of address maybe some of these systemic problems? And is it worth our while to tackle them now? Oh, I love the question, Eleanor. I think you've asked something that's very important. And uh, I feel like there's a few comments that Beth just made that I may also add to as part of this. Um, yes, you know, the challenges that we're facing today in some respects are not new, but they're absolutely heightened. And there are new challenges associated with the current context. The kind of challenges we had before were also as a result of having a short supply of workers. But, you know, we saw this coming a decade ago. and this sector is not unique. This is actually part of a broader labor market context. In fact, Stats Canada data put out in January show how this gap is going to grow across the economy, at least for the next 20 years, unless we see some sort of changes in, in how uh, some policy will operate. But it's not a simple fix. It's really just a demographic reality. And remember, it's, it's a global phenomena as well. Right? We're not the only country that is facing these challenges. 
Um, in fact, we're kind of middle of a pack if you look at the data in terms of uh, the acute shortages of workers and skill issues. So we're, we're globally, you know, we're competing on a global front. Not only is it a global industry, but we are competing for workers from a global lens. The other thing that's also very true and what's kind of made it more challenging is that the industry has also changed. The economy has changed with this pandemic, right? The nature of work is different. In fact, it's more complex. Uh, but also, you know, we're tapping into different markets. We're dealing with different issues. And so um, the skills gap is growing. So bottom line, it's far more complex. Um, before I forget as well, one thing I wanted to pick up on as an example, you were drawing the example of the sort of cascading or rippling effect of, of something. Here's one that people probably don't see so visibly, but is an example of a real problem. If we don't have enough cooks, it means that restaurants are not operating nearly at their capacity. This is happening across the board because without a cook means there's at least four or five servers that are also not done with employed, or it means there's also not a meal period offered or a day that it's closed. Well, this is happening in every, literally every region in Canada. And, I, and we could use many examples with it. Um, now, I think I might have forgot your question, Eleanor, but I was showing the context. This is a much broader scenario. Oh, you're asking if this is a good time to fix it. I think it's never been a better time in a way that we have um, the visibility of our issue and the focus from a policy point of view, I don't think has ever been sharper. We, have, we know just in my file alone in the last year, we've dealt with at least 17 federal departments and agencies that have some stake in responding to this issue. So it means that we have an opportunity now to reframe what needs to be done and to look at it with an understanding about how this really does impact the entire economy. It's not just a tourism issue. In fact, tourism has played such an integral role to uh, most economies in Canada, that, but maybe it wasn't as visible as it was, or people really felt the impacts in the last two years. Rural and remote Canada, urban centers were anchored on tourism businesses they were reliant on. It was the largest employer in Canada, one of the largest learning environments to get new, you know, to get people with a foothold in the labor market. Those opportunities have been lost and it's time to regain them. In fact, it's necessary for the economy to regrow. And it's very much part of the identity of Canada. Tourism is really the platform where you know, we share culture, we share ideas, we share the identity of what it means to be Canadian. We're feeling it, right? I mean, the last two years have been a tough slug, but we're not, you know, we're at a moment now, I think as a, as a society, I mean, globally, but most certainly in Canada where it's time to reawaken. And really what that means is that there's got to be different investments and different ways to value the nature of work in tourism. You know, I'll add one other thing to that, which I think is important maybe to just throw on the table here, but um, this is an opportunity for us to also be able to put a whole lot more into the sustainable development goals that the UN talks about, because tourism is such a key platform for that, and one way for Canada to deliver on a lot of those promises. Really, it's the mechanism that's going to make that happen. So, you know, it's just one example of how the stakes are higher than before, perhaps, at least they're more visible. And it's great to see that we're getting attention and support to move in that direction. Wow, uh, an amazing um, sort of overview there, Philip, of what's coming next. Um, it, it seems to me on a personal note, I remember when I was a young person, it was a dream among my whole cohort of young friends that we would uh, go out to the Banff Springs Hotel and work as a, as a young person, because that was just a really fun thing to do. and. And I've always thought of the tourism industry as a really fun place for young people to be. And so earlier you talked about getting getting back that sort of sense of spirit. I'm I'm, I'm sure you're hoping, like I am, that we can do that. Is that is that possible? Do you think for us to bring those it young is. people back? Yeah, it is. And I want to add, Eleanor, that it's got to be a lot more than those young people. Indeed, young people matter, but there's a lot of other people. I mean, our industry, two thirds of it, is not young. I mean, whatever that means today. I'm, not, I, you know, I'm getting old myself, but whatever. 25 plus, about 65% of our industry is over 25 in our real 
are there sort of as, as a long-term uh, career plan people, but the, the excitement is necessary for them to, you know, just in no, in no different, it's just different needs. Um, it is time, you know, people are really looking forward to it. You made a comment much earlier that you just reminded me of as well, you know, when we lost all those workers, we knew very early in the game that we would not see many of them return because the economy has grown and at the expense perhaps of our sector because we current we weren't able to offer employment and stable jobs and there was a lot of precarity and uncertainty they did move on they had to legitimately of course they're now working in many other industries we know mostly where they've gone getting them back is not going to be easy so you know, what is this spark? Who do we need to attract back? Well, our focus, of course, is on some of the more vulnerable populations that we can serve well, on new Canadians, on Indigenous workers who are eager and are a big part of this sector. So, you know, the rebuilding is a lot about bringing to the table those people that maybe didn't have the same employment opportunities as before while building on our base. So I think there's something to be said about what that means for them to be excited about these job opportunities. Um, you know, Patrick, uh, you know, Philip mentioned the precarity of the workforce. And uh, I remember Senator Sorensen, when she was the mayor of Banff, talking about bringing housing to Banff to help young people shoulder those costs. And, you know, this is an example, I think, of where governments can play a meaningful role. So. As you uh, work with the sector and work with the industry to begin to tackle these challenges, uh, what lies ahead for summer 2022 and beyond? Because I imagine that the minister is having conversations with his colleagues in the provinces and territories, given the, as, as our two colleagues have pointed out here, given the unanimous agreement that the, the sector has some immediate challenges, some of the medium term and some of the longer term and some of our systemic. So, I'm sure there will be vibrant conversations and a lot of unanimity across the country as the minister gathers for the next FTP, but what's on the radar screen from your perspective, having heard some of the challenges that are before us in terms of government's role? Yeah, well, I, th I think we kind of uh, pointed out the the major ones that we need to solve. And, and you know, some of them, there's some short-term fixes, you know, whether that's on existing programs we have. Some of them are, are longer-term fixes, you know, particularly talking about labor shortages. Um, but, but I think even, you know, even though we're in the summer of 22, everybody's ready to travel, you do need to keep in mind that we're, we're not fully through with, with COVID-19 as of yet. You know, we are seeing, we are seeing people get that, even the Prime Minister uh, a couple of weeks ago. So I think we do need to make sure that we're going to remain vigilant about COVID-19 uh, so that we can keep the amount of our tourism industry going right now. And, uh, and so as we as we continue to open up here, just to, to keep that in mind. Um, you know, and we've talked about a number of the uh, the different types of tourism that we have in the country, but we haven't really talked so much about business travel. And I think that's an area we really need to focus on going forward, um, because of course, over the last couple of years, we have not had the big conferences. And those are the that's the type of tourism that actually drives the most revenue, because not only do people come here for, for the, that event, you know, they're here on their, their company dime, they're spending a lot of money. Um, but, you know, if you have a very good experience, you're more, more likely to come back and then visit as a, as a tourist again. So there's a lot of work that we need to do to make sure that we're going to continue to attract that type of, uh, of business travel um, so, uh, so that we can have that. And the other area that has been very uh, hit, been hit very hard over the last couple of years is some of the high value, low value tourism. So when I'm speaking of that, I mean things like uh, fishing lodges, uh, like, like guide outfitters, like um, heli skiing. Some of those, uh, some of those types of uh, trips where typically there's less domestic tourists that will do that. Um, but uh, in not having international visitors for the last couple of years has meant that those uh, those businesses have been hit very hard. So we do need to focus on, on working with them, and as we're we're going to be marketing going forward. Uh, making sure that we're, we're reminding people of of that travel as well as all of our travel um, options and so so we have made some large investments into destination canada there's about a hundred million dollars that was given to it uh, in the budget last year and over half of that is going to be going or about half of that is going to be going to the united states which is our, our typically our largest source of uh, our largest market for tourism um, but also making sure that we're focusing on 
some of the the different attractions that we want to promote and, and you know, the the high volume high value low volume tourism is one of it uh, but also for instance our indigenous um, uh, tourism destinations like like the high value low volume they've been hit really hard over the last couple of years and that is an area that was growing incredibly quickly pre-pandemic that we have some major opportunities going forward especially as we're looking ahead to hosting some some large um large international events like the world cup coming up in a, in a few years and so i think we have an opportunity to really highlight the best of what canada has to offer and the vast diversity of what we have in canada so i think uh, you know as we're looking to recover uh, we can really focus on those areas where we can see that major growth and where there is going to be a big demand for something that is very unique to canada that, uh, that a lot of people don't know yet um Awesome. I mean, a quick bullet round because I think we're uh, getting near the end and Andrew's going to come back to us in a moment. This has been such a rich conversation. It could go on for another hour, at least from my point of view. But I'm, I'm going to turn, building on Patrick's comments, uh, you know, certainly if I may, just very quickly, Patrick, uh, our organization, the Trans-Canada Trail, uh, uh, the Government of Canada recently very generously invested in the Trans-Canada Trail in the last budget, for which we're enormously grateful. We're working with Beth and her colleagues at IAC and Canada to create Canada's national first national trails tourism strategy and certainly Minister Boissonneau is an eager and early participant we are in his mandate letter so we'll be looking to really bring Canadians to the trails that we have across our country we have the longest trail in the world of course and they are a conveyance of people to each other and to nature that that Canadians really value so stay tuned for more on that because I think we have a role to play as well that we welcome in helping to return the sector to health um, as, as Canadians and of course an international uh, momentum around outdoor tourism and you've got lots of that in your writing. Before I move on I wondered if you had had con conversations with any uh, people in your writing that maybe have left the Cetric sector Patrick and it's a, a putting you on the spot a little bit there and maybe you haven't had those conversations but perhaps you've had the chance to talk to them folks who have left and maybe some insights as to how we get them back. Yeah, and I, I think I mean Phil mentioned all the the different um, you know factors that play that were leading people to decide a career change. You know, part of it was by necessity once the sector was was shut down for public health reasons, um, and you know part of it were, were people that continue to work in the sector and um, were the subject of of oftentimes some very frustrated clients that perhaps were not happy about having to wear a mask or or dealing with uh, you know lines because of labor shortages and otherwise. And they, and they found opportunities in other sectors and the precarity of the work is was certainly a big factor of it as well um and also just the advent of being able to work from home I've, I've spoken to a few people that have gotten jobs working in the tech sector um and uh and so there really is a as a diversity of reasons and the other factor that was actually quite large in um in in the resort that i'm in right now is that a huge part of the workforce is international Yes. And so we couldn't even have uh, people coming here, um, uh, for instance, on the holiday working visa until after September 2021. And so that that year and a half uh, without that, uh, just like we couldn't have any international tourists other than people here on essential travel, uh, that had a huge, huge impact. And we're only starting to see that return now. So, um, so you know, I think that there's a there's a few issues at play there. And just as a way of, of encouraging people to get back um, into this or people to enter it in the first time, I think there's things that, that uh, the industry can do to really promote it, to show how it's a great place to work. And, you know, just the things you mentioned about the desire of, of working in a, you know, a globally uh, recognized place like, like Banff, um, that's a pretty special experience. And I think there's things the industry can do. I think there's things that the government can do as well. And uh, this really is the time for, for us to be doing it. And, and the last thing that, that Philip mentioned, which I think is, is, a, is a big one, um, is just how there's opportunities in different areas of the country. And we've really focused on how to support people working in the trades to, to go from one area to another where there's opportunities. I think that's an area that we can look at uh, as, as the federal government as well as provincial governments to make sure that we're supporting people to, to go to where the opportunities are. Um, and where the jobs are. Thank you. Thanks very much, Patrick. That's, that's uh, terrific. I'm I'm just uh, thinking of of time, and again, Andrew's going to join us momentarily. But 
Beth and Philip, I'm going to ask both of you this question. So cast your minds forward to a year from now. And what does success look like? You probably, it's a tough question because I'm sure it changes on, on, on a daily basis for you. But I'm going to start with you, Beth, and maybe really get a summary from you about what does success look like? It's, it's a year from now. We're on the cusp of another busy tourism season. Of course, we like to, we're a four season in this country. But nonetheless, what, what does that look like uh, from a success point of view for you? Well, success looks like more Canadians choosing Canada as a destination, and therefore our travel deficit remains low. Um, and more more international um, travelers are coming uh, back to Canada, um, including those those elusive business travelers and and business events. Um, you know, we know that. Um, direct foreign investment comes from those international uh, travelers, whether they're for leisure or for business. And so um, it's it's a, a really good system if we can get uh, those international visitors coming into Canada. But, but the other thing that that I will say is that, um, you know, we 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 are making a lot of uh, strides and, and working towards um, really changing, starting to change people's minds about uh, the travel and tourism industry as a place to work. And, and you know, we've got a, a real culture shift and, and Patrick alluded to it, but we've got a real culture shift that we need to um, undertake in this country. And it's going to take a while, a year won't do it, but we really need people to start to revere uh, the jobs in our sector, much like they do in almost every other country in the world. Well said. Philip. Success in a year. Well, a year, um, we'll see some progress. I want to be optimistic here, but I know it's going to be a longer period than a year to get us where we need to be. But my hope is that uh, we will have a very coordinated, cohesive, collaborative approach. There's lots of evidence we're on that track. So that will be an all of sector, all of government, all of community approach, really focused on addressing the labor challenges we have. And with that in mind, really sustained resources to focus on improving on the challenges. You know, so that's the skilling, that's the attraction and the retention of these workers. It's basically a change in culture. So, you know, to me, it's all about responding to these needs and looking at them differently with bold choices. So my hope is that we reach those targets and with that, a strong foundation to succeed for the following years. Thank you, Philip. Thank you all. Andrew, I see you've joined us, uh, and I know you've got some questions from the audience, so uh, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you, Eleanor. Um, everyone can hear me okay. Uh, first, apologies to Patrick for introducing you as Michael, but uh, Patrick Weiler, everybody else called you Patrick, so at least they, they got it all right. Uh, my apologies. Um, it's okay. Uh, listen, a, a few questions here, and, I'm, and then I'm going to... One question that's coming, which I think will be a good question to end on, and I'll just give you notice of that, which is, can each of you mention one or two places people should be thinking of visiting this summer? So you've got a couple of minutes to think about that. Uh, Patrick, I'm sure you're going to want to, want to mention uh, Whistler or, or Sea to Sky Country, my God, but you're also allowed to mention other parts of the country. Um, so that'll be the last question for you to pose up on. Um, question uh, for you, uh, Phil, to start with. Uh, what would it take for the tourism sector to increase wage levels to attract a more permanent workforce? I think that's another very good question. It's one we get asked quite a lot. Um, I want to be clear about something here. There are well over 400 kinds of occupations in the sector. Some, of course, are paid on the lower end because of the nature of skills and the type of work, but some are also very highly paid. Think of pilots, for example, if we use one quick one. So there is quite a range there. I think the question in a way is asking more about the one, the jobs that are at the, at the lower end, what can be done about it? Well, already we're seeing increases. Part of it is because of inflation, but part of it is also because of the nature of the work changing. And the full compensation package, looking at what they offer has really been elevated. So, I mean, part of it is business practice. I, this sounds like such a simple answer, but it's because of time I won't elaborate, but if businesses change the way they're managing their operations and their product and their service, there's room to increase those salaries in some regions and some areas. 
that doesn't uh, get us out of the hot water in some in some cases, but um, there's lots of room for improvement there. Okay, uh, thank you. I'll ask um, uh, the, the next question to to Beth and Eleanor. Um, do you expect Canadians to be traveling more within Canada uh, in the year ahead? Well, I'll just say I hope so. Um, you know, I think that one of the silver lines of the pandemic when our borders were closed is that Canadians really started to dis really discover what amazing experiences we have here at home. And uh, and really, um, all of those experiences, you know, they're run by our neighbours. Um, and so, you know, in the, the spirit of um, you know, helping each other through this and coming out the other side of it in the best possible position that we can. I really, really hope that Canadians will continue to choose to travel in Canada. Um, thank you. Eleanor, and your, your chance to talk about the trails and holidaying in Canada. Sure. I, I just want to start, thank you, Andrew, answering that question by saying that Beth is always just being terribly self-deprecating. She and Philip and uh, colleagues at Destination Canada and the, the entire sector really turned on a dime to pivot and embrace opportunities. I know that word pivot is a little overused, but it's it seems adroit in this perfect example of how the industry was really building the plane while it was flying um, and scrambling and moving quickly to give Canadians the kinds of experiences that are local in nature and really speak to that flavor and the beauty of local experiences because close to home staycation has really in the early stages uh, begun to define the recovery of the sector so as we contemplate inviting international tourists back and that's really the mainstay of our conversation today and some of the challenges we're facing um, trails fit nicely into that staycation arena uh, giving Canadians that local uh, flavor you know the Trans Canada Trail the longest in the world as I mentioned earlier is national in scope but it's really local in flavor most Canadians um, use trails um, in fact their trail use um, went up 50 percent during the pandemic so 70 percent of those same Canadians said they're going to keep using trail which is good for all of us and a large number about 75 percent of them said they were planning on making trails part of their travel intentions these that that last data point is a little bit old as uh, prior to the opening up that we're now, but nonetheless, the best point, I hope that we're going to see Canadians uh, think of their own backyard, think of their community, think about their province, think about their country when it comes to staying here because those businesses, those workers, those economies really need and could benefit from the Canadian tourists that can spend money close to home and benefit those small communities where they live. And, and Patrick, do you expect the Canadians to be traveling more within Canada this this year? Um, I, I definitely think so. And uh, you know, there was quite a bit of travel within Canada last year. There's actually some parts of my riding that had record levels of tourism last year, just because areas that had been close to urban areas had uh, had seen more. Um, but I, I think we, I mean, we are seeing Canadians travel internationally a lot more right now, and we're seeing that with the unforeseen unprecedented amount of demand for passports at this point as well um, but but Canadians very much are traveling across the country um, it is impacted by the high cost of gas right now so that that is having an impact particularly yeah. road trips um, but I know there is increased demands for things like cruises which were not operating for the last couple of years as well as for riding the train and so I think those are two areas that you know Canadians weren't able to experience last year that uh, that they are experiencing now and there still is with a lot of folks um you know some some remaining concern about um about the pandemic and so particularly opportunities that are outdoor in large places which we are you know, so blessed to have throughout the country there's there's a large demand and so i think particularly in areas where people are able to explore the great outdoors there's been quite a bit of demand that i've heard of thank you uh, the next question i'll ask uh, uh, beth to answer this um, and and uh, Patrick mentioned it earlier, the World Cup. Um, with Canada being selected as the as one of the nations to host the World Cup in 2026, how do you think that will affect to the tourism sector as a whole, and will that possibly speed up the return back to pre-COVID numbers? You know, major events, sporting events like the like you know the the, the World Cup. Um, are huge draws and they, they put Canada on the international stage. And I will just say, you know, it's not just soccer that's going to be 
you know, um, uh, showcased. I mean, you know, this coming April, we're hosting the, the World Men's Curling Championships here in, in Ottawa. Um, you know, we are, you know, the host of, of, of many great events and they really do help put us on the stage. And we also have to thank the media that cover those events. You know, they do those vignettes of, you know, the destinations where the, the game that they're about to cover is going to take place. And that helps showcase some of our great destinations uh, to, you know, sport fans that may not have uh, ever thought of coming to our great country. So they are really important to us, um, both from a attracting international visitors to come and see us, but also for getting the word out about uh, our destinations and, and, uh, and you know, educating educating folks who may not have thought of coming to Canada. Yeah. Okay, uh, Philip Mondor, I'll ask you this question. It's going to be a tough one. Um, with, with the news of the trucker convoy returning back to Ottawa, have you found these sorts of protests have affected tourism in some major cities? And, indeed, it has. It's another example of a disruption that really impacts the operations and in turn you know that that has you know that that crosses over the entire um, you know business and organization. So you know it's keep an example in Ottawa. I mean, my office is right in the hub of where that is, where all of that trucker uh, convoy occurred. Um, basically, it keeps real tourists away, right? And it's not uh, tenable to operate those businesses when the unrest is happening. So, and it has lingering impacts. So yes, it has it has a great it's a great challenge to the sector. Okay, switch gears. This is your, your closing comment. Um, I'll start with you, Philip. Um, what are your one or two places that uh, people should be visiting this summer? You're not going to like my answer, but it's an accurate one. I think they have to go where they haven't been. There's lots of room in Canada. There's every experience you can imagine. And if I had to also add to that, I would say um, doesn't matter where you go in Canada, there's an Indigenous tourism experience worth checking out. So that gives you a chance to go right across Canada and have all kinds of unique experiences. So I'll, I'm, I'm not going to pin down to a singular location other than someplace you haven't been because there's no shortage of opportunity. Oh, I don't know if I can give you a lot of points for that answer. It's a, it's a good one, but you did sidestep. Um, Eleanor, are you going to do the same thing and say visit the trail anywhere across Canada? Gosh, okay. I knew how you were going to react to Philip, who, by the way, his, his question was excellent. I, I uh, concur. Um, as an organization that values its uh, truth and reconciliation commitments and its indigenous relationships, we are working with our robust uh, network of tourism partners, indigenous tourism partners across the country. So that's a bit of a plug, but I will say this, um, I'm on the board of the Canada Games. It's happening this summer and it's the first uh, multi-sport games post pandemic and Canada is hosting uh, the country and Canadians, 5,000 athletes are coming to Niagara this summer. So. And Niagara Falls is obviously a global address, but I think the surrounding communities and the richness of the beauty of the Niagara region, inclusive of robust indigenous experiences, makes Niagara a must-see this summer, and the Games open August the 6th. Okay, thank you. Beth Potter, what are your picks? All right, so <laughs> it's really hard for me to pick, but what I would what I would recommend to everyone is, you know, get a map out, check two hours from home, find a festival or an indigenous experience and go and do that. Um, and, and find out what's so cool in your own backyard. And then, you know, if you've done that, look at the province or the territory next door. We have so many cool experiences. I mean, when I say next door, I mean, you know, I live in Ontario. If I go next door to Manitoba, I can go and see polar bears. You know, if I go next door to Quebec, you know, I can, you know, have some amazing music and, and food experiences. Right now, I am in Nova Scotia and I've been taking in everything maritime. So there are just so many amazing experiences in this country. Choose to go where you haven't been, to Philip's point, go next door. Like just, yeah. there's so much that's close to home. Yeah, Patrick, over to you. Well, you know, I, there's no better place to travel to in the country than West Vancouver, Sunshine Coast, see this kind of country. So <laughs> I'll, I'll just say that um, there's something for everybody here. 
um, whether that's in Squamish or, or Whistler or Pemberton or the Sunshine Coast. So, um, you know, if you haven't been here before, definitely come check it out. Um, but I, I do want to agree with what was said before. Um, think of the areas that maybe have struggled the last couple of years, whether that's Indigenous tourism, whether that's um, major festivals, which didn't happen. Consider what's what may be happening around you. Um, think about museums, galleries, uh, areas like that where uh, people have been through a difficult time um, and, uh, you know, help them to get back to what they are and the incredible value and culture that they provide our, our country. So definitely, definitely check those things out. Uh, go see something that you haven't seen before and just enjoy the great diversity that Canada has to offer. Yeah. Uh, Patrick, take, t take a moment just to tell people what Sea to Sky Country means. It's incredible. Yeah, so it, it's uh, it, it's a region, it's also the name of the highway, but it, it goes everywhere from the ocean all the way to the mountains. And so it starts in the fjord of Howe Sound, Alcatsum area, which is now recognized as UNESCO Biosphere Reserve. And then it goes through up to Squamish, through the valley, all the way up to the, the snow-capped mountains of Whistler. So in my mind, it's the most beautiful drive in the world, as you can see a little bit of everything saw some bears on the highway yesterday and some deer. Um, and uh, and it's just a short hop and escape from the airport in Vancouver. So uh, and, and how long is the, is the whole drive where you can be water skiing and skiing in the same day? Um, well, you could be doing that with uh, all in Whistler right now. You can ski on the glacier right now. And you can go water skiing on the, uh, on the lakes, just right at the bottom of the base. So uh, you don't have to travel very far. <laughs> Yeah, it, it is an amazing country. I, I just got it. What as you were talking, I, uh, many years ago, I was I was taking a train from from London to Scotland, and people were were telling me what a beautiful ride it was going to go. I was, I was going by train, and I've got to say that after having seen so much of Canada, I found that to be extremely boring. We <laughs> just have so much beauty in Canada that um you know other parts of the world just don't hold a candle to what we have to offer so so thanks for reminding us about uh, what an incredible country we have to, to visit both in natural beauty and and the people thank you all very much uh beth potter uh, eleanor mcmahon and phil mondor thank you for being part of this discussion uh pa patrick uh weiler thank you for being part of it and i think you've you've uh, had a lot that you can take back to to your colleagues in parliament that you've heard uh, from your colleagues on this panel and from the questions. Uh, thanks for what you do. Now, as we as we tune out, I just want to say the, uh, we can't hear the audience applauding your wonderful uh, participation. So I, I'd say this is a time to to applaud each other and applaud the great tourism that we have to, to experience in, in Canada this summer. So thanks everybody and here we go.